it looks like the uh, flow of people in has slowed down. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, my name is Seth Wiesman. Uh, <laughs> I am a solutions architect at Ververica and a committer on Apache Flink. Uh, before we go any further, I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Gordon, who uh, was supposed to give this talk with me, uh, but was unable to do so today. He was a big help in getting the slides put together. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I want to talk about state today and uh, why I think it is such an important component in Apache Flink and so important for uh, users to understand. I think when you when you think about the project, right? If someone came up to me that had never heard of Flink before and said, "What is this thing?" Right? What is Apache Flink? It can feel a little difficult to give an answer sometimes because it has grown to be such a broad ecosystem. On the one hand, there is the table API uh, that is unified over batch and streaming, and so I could say Flink is a framework for doing massively parallel data processing over exabytes of batch data. And that would be a technically correct answer. But I could also say that it was a framework for building event-driven applications uh, using Stateful Functions, the newest uh, API that we recently released. And the question is, what do these things have to do with each other? Right? Why are they all a part of the same framework? Uh, why are they all under the umbrella of Apache Flink? If you have ever been on the Flink website, there's this diagram that shows the different APIs, right? Table API, data stream, stateful functions, uh, and they're all sitting on top of the Flink runtime, right? And so that tells you that there must be something, uh, some commonality across these. And in my mind, all these APIs are really just exposing the core primitive of Apache Flink in different ways. And that core primitive is consistent, stateful, single record at a time processing. Right? That is what Apache Flink is. Everything else is details. And single record at a time processing is what makes Flink flexible. I encourage you to go uh, listen to some talks about the network stack. Uh, it's a very impressive piece of engineering. Uh, and state management is what makes Flink powerful. And so state is what we're going to discuss today. So with Flink, we like to think a lot about state. Uh, this pop quiz is less fun when I can't see everyone's hands. But uh, the question is, when do you uh, throw away your state and start over? Right? We, if you've used Flink in the past, you know there's checkpoints and save points. And you can take a save point, uh, stop your job, start a new job, restart from that state. When would you not want to do that? Right? When would you say, you know, it's time to throw it all away and start over? The answer is never, right? Uh, that would be like saying, when do I drop all the tables in my database? The answer is you don't. Uh, your state is the most valuable component of any Flink application. It's what tells you what is happening uh, internally. It shows you the whole state of the world, uh, where you've been, where you're going. It's the most long-lived component of any Flink uh, system. Right? You're going to change your code. You're going to redeploy with new configurations. You're going to have many Flink jobs but your state is with you forever. And so we need to make sure we have tools that allow us uh, to carry it forward. Same way that uh, your state uh, rows in a database are not simply static, but can be modified. Your Flink state needs to be flexible uh, depending on the changes you are going to make in your application over time. And so we need to think about how we evolve stateful Flink streaming applications. Right? This is like running an alter table statement in a database. As your requirements change, we need to be able to evolve your state along with them. And so let's first think about what a stateful application upgrade looks like. Uh, you're running this code in production. You have your user code. It's working with its embedded local state backend. Uh, this could be the heap state backend or RocksDB. But we know that it is local. Uh, and very fast to access. Eventually, we are going to take a save point, right? It's time to do this upgrade. I have the new version of my code. So I'm going to take a save point, which is a uh, globally distributed consistent snapshot of the state of my application at a logical point in time, right? I'm saying take all the states, copy it over somewhere where it can be persisted. This may be HDFS, an NFS drive, S3, 
uh, any sort of object store works. And so then we can turn off the one flink job, upgrade our application, right? Deploy this new user code and then reload our state into the state backend, right? We want to do this consistently so that we know exactly where we left off and we can continue processing on as if nothing had ever happened. And then we just keep running, right? And it's as if we had no downtime. We don't lose any records. We don't lose any state. Uh, we just continue processing on. And so this works really well if you are just making simple business logic changes, right? Uh, I was filtering out all records with a value less than two, and tomorrow I want to filter out all records with a value less than three. Right? This just works. But what if your schema evolves? Right? Uh, again, this is your alter table statement. I was storing uh, a long in state, and tomorrow I want to store uh, two longs in a string. What happens? How do I do that? Well, if you've worked with Flink in the past, and we're showing uh, some code from the data stream API, uh, you've probably seen something like this. You have your state that is registered with uh, the state back, and it's registered with Flink's runtime based on a state descriptor. This provides you both a name, right? So this is my value state and a type. And the type uh, is translated into what Flink calls type information. So this is like Flink's own internal type system, and it's how we derive serializers. So when we store your value in state, when it goes on disk with RacksDB or onto HDFS with your save points, how are we actually going to serialize this data? And we're able to infer type information based on a number of different criteria. So out of the box, Flink supports all the JVM primitive types you would expect. So ints, doubles, longs, uh, strings, et cetera. Uh, Flink has its own uh, set of tuples. So uh, tuple 0 through, I believe it's 22, 23. Uh, there are customized specialized serializers for those. Uh, along with common access patterns we see on JVM languages. So uh, think POJOs in Java or case classes in Scala. There is support for Apache Avro, so a very uh, popular serialization schema. And if your type does not fit any of those criteria, Flink will fall back to cryo. So that allows us to serialize arbitrary data uh, into your state backend or safe point. And so as we evolve, right, you are going to make changes to your application. Right? So I was storing my state type. And uh, perhaps this is an, uh, an Avro class. In that case, Flink supports schema evolution for Avro out of the box, meaning that if we have uh, this employee and it was storing a name today, and tomorrow they also have a job title, this is going to just work. You're going to upgrade your class. You're going to redeploy your code, and it will be as if the every record has always had a title associated with it. Uh, the default in this case will be null. In Avro, you could also specify a default, in which case that will be used. And we follow the uh, Avro 1.7.7 uh, schema spec. So I really like Avro. Uh, I generally encourage users uh, to pick Avro in production because it has such well-defined schema migration semantics. Right, you know exactly what you're getting. You know exactly what you can and cannot do. It's very easy to reason about. Uh, one of the really neat things is that you can actually swap between generic and specific records. So if you are not quite ready to uh, commit to a certain type, uh, you don't need to do that right away. We also support uh, schema migration for Java POJO types. So that's a little more restrictive. Uh, because there isn't a explicit spec in the way there is with Avro. But you can add and remove fields. Uh, but you cannot change the types of fields. So uh, name is a string. I could not suddenly change it to uh, some custom type or a long or uh, anything else like that. And the name of your POJO type uh, cannot change. And this includes the namespace. So wherever you put it originally is where it needs to remain. but uh, if you simply need to go from an employee with a name to an employee with a name and a title, this will work. Again, uh, when we perform this migration, it will have a default value of null, 
but that's okay. Uh, your code can handle that. And so as Flink sits today, uh, there is out-of-the-box schema migration for Apache Avro and POJOs. Uh, but there's still some work to do. So we want to add support for tuples, both uh, Flink's tuples and Scala tuples, uh, along with Scala case classes. And I would love to see other formats. So something like Protobuf or Thrift uh, would be really great to have working out-of-the-box. These are really great ways to get involved. So if you have been using Flink in the past, if you have been thinking about contributing back to the project in some way, uh, these uh, schemas adding support for migration across these different formats is a very self-contained change. And so you can get your hands dirty with this without having to concern yourself with the entire Flink runtime. Uh, it is a big project. Uh, it can feel a little intimidating. This is a very, uh, specific change that you can make. Uh, if you're, that's something you're interested in, please reach out on the dev mailing list. I am incredibly confident there will be uh, committers happy to help you uh, get that change merged in. And so the question is, how does this work, right? Um, schema migration is intended to just work out of the box. Uh, you use POJOs, you use Avro, and it just works. You upgrade your code, your schemas migrates, we're done, we continue processing on. Uh, but this is a tech conference. I know people like to hear uh, how things really work under the hood. And this is not a feature that has been around since uh, Flink 1.0. Uh, I believe that support for Avro first landed in 1.8 and then POJOs in 1.9. The question is, right, if this is such a key feature, if state is so important, why did it take as long as it did? So. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to use the terms data schema and serialization format interchangeably. Uh, because as it turns out, the way that Flink manages state, these really are the same thing. And it's also important to note that the community considers state part of its public API, meaning that if you take a save point on Flink 1.9, you are guaranteed to be able to restore that on Flink 1.10. You will always have an upgrade path. So that means that even if we were not happy with what we were doing in Flink 1.4, for instance, we couldn't just throw everything away and start over. We needed to have uh, these upgrade paths. So schema migration took several releases as we slowly move things uh, to the format that we wanted them to be. And evolving your state's uh, data schema requires evolving its serializer. So I said these terms are interchangeable, and the reason is when I take a save point on one version of Flink and I want to restore it with another version, uh, and I have a new uh, format for my code, right? I have this employee POJO and I added a field. Really what I have to be able to do is deserialize those old bytes into my, excuse me, my new format. And this isn't as easy as it may first seem, right? Different versions of user code may contain different classes on its class path. So uh, that old version of employee probably no longer exists. I can't simply look at it and see what was the old format. Uh, that information needs to be encoded in my state. And we'll also see that the different state backends have different serialization behavior. So even though we, as a user, you should be able to uh, pick whichever state backend makes the most sense for your code, and it should not affect the behavior of your application. It does have implications uh, for the runtime, and so it has implications for the Flink contributor community. So let's start with the heap state backend. Uh, we are working with our code, and we are running in our local state backend. Uh, this is a data structure that lives on the JVM heap. So it is local. In fact, it is thread local to your user code. Uh, when you, you can think of this as a specialized hash map uh, from the Java collection. Uh, it's significantly more uh, tuned than that, but conceptually, it's the same thing. And so when you store a record in state or you read a record from state, that is just a pointer copy, right? I am storing a pointer to an object on the heap in my state backend. I am retrieving a pointer to an object on the JVM heap from my state backend. There's no serialization happening uh, in your per record code path. 
When we want to write out a save point or checkpoint, that is when serialization occurs. So your records will be serialized in the background as data is being written out to disk. Now we are going to do our upgrade, right? I have this new version of my code and I want to go ahead and restore. So when I pull those bytes back in, again, my uh, state backend is on the heap. And so I need to deserialize my V1 bytes into my V2 object. And this all occurs before we run your user code. And then finally, we can just continue processing on, right? So I had my old version of employee. I deserialized this into my new version of employee. And now from your user code's perspective, it's as if we always had the two fields in our POJO. The next time we serialize the state back out, we take another checkpoint or save point, it will use our V2 serializer. You'll notice that we never have multiple versions of a type stored in our state. It's always V1 or it is always V2, et cetera. We never need to worry about uh, interoperating between uh, V1, 2, and 3 all at the same time. So with the heap state backend, again, serialization happens in the background on restore and snapshot. You can think this is lazy serialization and eager deserialization. And so by nature, Restoring a snapshot is a state migration, right? When I deserialized my old bytes into my new class, I migrated my code. But this does require some written form of the previous serializer. So I need some information encoded in my state that says, this is the schema that I wrote out. And we need to be able to use that information to read it out into our new format. So let's think about out of core state backends, uh, RocksDB being the one that would immediately come to mind. So while RocksDB is a uh, local state backend, right? there is no uh, network happening, it, ha it is on local disk, it is still on disk, meaning that we do need to serialize our data on every read and write. We're always going across a JNI boundary, and so your serializer is on the per record code path. When we want to take a save point or checkpoint now, that does mean that our uh, state is already serialized and we simply need to copy out the bytes. Uh, when you, in fact, when you take an incremental uh, checkpoint from RocksDB, it is quite literally just copying the files from disk. But now I wanna go and upgrade my code, right? I have my new uh, serializer, I have employee v2 with title, and I wanna restore. Well. Again, I'm just going to pull those binary files back onto local disk, except this time it is the bytes still in my V1 format, but I have my user code that expects version V2, right? I'm expecting employee with a uh, title, for instance. And so the question is, can we simply access this with our V2 serializer, right? Can it go and read these bytes and understand them? Well, not necessarily. It requires a migration. We want to go through and upgrade all of your code from the V1 version in byte format to V2 in byte format. <coughs> Excuse me. And so when you're working with RocksDB or any other, uh, let's say, out of core state backend, we get eager serialization and lazy deserialization. You serialize on every write but you only deserialize on read. And so after restore, the state migration is going to occur uh, on the first access if schema has changed. Meaning that when you call uh, get runtime context dot get value state, it will take a look and see, hey, you've plugged in a new serializer. This is different than what is stored on disk. In this case, it will migrate all of your code, meaning it will read out each record into the new format and then re-serialize it back in that new format. The way that we do this without having your previous classes on the class path is through the uh, what's called a type serializer snapshot. And so what we don't want to do, what we do not do is serialize the serializer, right? I could not simply write out 
uh, my V1 serializer, because again, it may not exist. Instead, we're going to write out its configuration. So I have my POJO serializer, or even better, I have my Avro serializer. It's a little easier to think about. And Avro has a schema. And so when I write out my bytes, when I write out my snapshot, I'm also going to include uh, my Avro schema. If this is a POJO, we have our own little internal uh, POJO schema uh, representation. So it encodes all the information about how the state was written out and serves as a factory for the previous serializer. So now, when we write this out, we have all of our bytes. We also have this snapshot that says, here's how we wrote out these bytes. Here's what serializer v1 was doing. And on restore, we're going to first pull out our snapshot. We're going to say, what is the configuration that was used? And we are going to use that to configure a custom serializer that knows how to take v1 bytes and read them into v2 objects. If you've used Avro in the past, you can think about these, this as uh, reader and writer schemas. Right? I'm going to read from my old uh, version into my new version. Uh, with my RocksDB, it's going to be the same thing. We're going to look at our snapshot. We're going to determine if this schema has changed. And if it is, we will configure this special serializer that knows how to read v1 bytes into v2 objects. We are going to deserialize that and then reserialize it back to disk using our new v2 serializer. Again, this puts us in the position of never having to deal with multiple versions at the same time. Uh, but there are some limitations, just like there are limitations when you run an alter table statement on a database, right? Uh, there's a lot of freedom that is allowed to you when you create a new table originally. But when you create, when you want to alter a table that already has rows, there are certain limitations you need to be aware of. Right? It needs to be backwards compatible in some way. And so currently, we cannot change the type of a class field. Uh, we cannot change the name of a class. If you attempt to do this, it will fail the migration and fail your job. So it will fail early. And you'll see, hey, there was an issue. Uh, this migration is not supported. Please uh, do something different. Uh, for example, we cannot go from a list state to a map state. I could change the type. Uh, I could change my POJO within a list state. right? I could have a list of employees and go from just a name to a name and a title. But I could not go from list state to map state, because how would I do that mapping? How would I determine my key and my value? And so that brings us to the state processor API. And, you know, again, we're talking about our state being so important. And with schema migration and with the state backends, uh, the Flink community is hoping to service uh, the common 90% of use cases. But being such a large ecosystem and large community, there's no way that we are ever going to be able to uh, offer solutions for every single need that every single user has, right? It's just not practical. And so the state processor API is meant to support the other 10%, right? You should always use the built-in features if you can. You should always use native schema migration if you can. But if you can't, if you really do want to go from a list state to a map state, for instance, and you know how to do that custom mapping with some uh, custom Java code of your own, this is the tool for you. So some of the use cases of the state processor API are for uh, performing offline or exploratory analysis of your states, right? So this is a batch library for processing save points. Think about this as running a select statement on your production database, right? You're just trying to get a sense of what is going on inside of there. Uh, we may use that for auditing or troubleshooting our jobs. Uh, perhaps I am getting bad results and I don't know what's going on, right? Uh, it may be my Flint code, it may be another system, we just don't know. And what I would like to do is take a peek under the covers and see are the values in state for some particular keys what I expect them to be, right? Let's just make a sanity check. Uh, is the data as I expect? Uh, if it is, then good news. 
Uh, Flink is not the problem. It seems that some other system is having issues. But if it isn't, uh, if they are not what you expect them to be, then we're going to need to go in and make some changes. It looks like we have released a bug into production. Another really common use case is to bootstrap state for your operators. Uh, most streaming applications do not come out of the blue. Uh, very often, they are continuations of existing batch processes. What that means is we may have uh, many years of historical data sitting in a data warehouse somewhere that we need to use to as the initial state of our application. You could imagine that we have a job that is keeping track of accounts, uh, bank accounts. And the uh, value in state is the current balance in that account. But before I can start processing new transactions, I need to bootstrap my application with the initial account balances for all accounts within my system. Uh, and it also gives us the possibility of uh, rewriting our snapshots. So maybe we really do want to make a breaking schema change. I called my class employee, but I really want to call it uh, employee two. Or I want to change this type from a string to uh, a long or back, or vice versa. Flink isn't going to be able to support that out of the box. Uh, and it probably never will. But you can do that yourself, right? You know how to make this mapping. Uh, we can even think about correcting invalid states. So this would be very similar to running an update statement in a production database. It's probably not what you want to be doing. Uh, ideally, we have done some better testing. We are avoiding making these kinds of changes. But uh, you know, in case of fire, break glass, it's good to have this kind of tool in your back pocket. It also allows us to alter our max parallelism. So max parallelism is hard coded into your save point for a number of reasons, uh, and Flink, and it cannot be altered. Uh, unless you use the state processor API, in which case you can rewrite your save point uh, to have a higher max parallelism. But again, I want to reiterate what I said at the beginning. This is not a replacement for native schema migration. You should always reach for that first. You should always, uh, in your new Flink jobs, if you're not doing this already, use POJOs, use Avro, use something that is just going to work. This, otherwise, this will be way more work than you want to put in. And so, Really, why does this whole API exist? It's because Flink state is valuable data. It's the most important thing we have. And Flink is a tool for processing valuable data. Seems obvious that it should be able to process itself. And so that is the state processor API. When we think about reading and writing our save points, when we think about using uh, state processor API, it is based on this relational model. Uh, so if you're familiar with databases, uh, it has this very clean mapping. Uh, and there, this is very well described in the documentation. I'm not going to uh, harp on this right now, mostly for the sake of time. But it gives you a nice mental model to, to think about how to read and write birth states. So let's say we have this key process function. I have a value state storing my state class. Uh, if you've used Flink in the past, I'm sure this looks very familiar. We're going to go ahead and implement a keyed state reader function. Uh, and you'll see, if you look inside of open, that we're doing exactly the same thing as before. We have a value state. We're registering our value state descriptor. We're passing the same name and class and getting it all set up. Now, read key will be called for every key in our state backend. And we can read out our states. In this case, we are creating a tuple with the key and the value in state and then passing it downstream for further processing. There's also a context that gives us extra information, such as reading out our timers. To use this, we then create an existing save point. So we're going to load our save point based on its path, where it may be living on HDFS, S3, et cetera, and the uh, configured state backend. And then we're going to read from that operator. So uh, here's my UID. Here's my reader function. I now have a data set of this tuple that I'm reading out. Go ahead and do whatever processing you like to do. Uh, beyond supporting keyed state, we also support uh, all the operator state types, so list state, union state, broadcast state, et cetera. And we can also write state. So again, uh, maybe we want to bootstrap initial state for a new application. Or even more important, we have an existing application. It already has state. We are adding a new operator, and we need to somehow bootstrap the state for that new operator without losing the state in our existing operators. Uh, we're going to keep going with this bank account example. And imagine we have this account POJO, right? 
account ID, and total balance. We will create a keyed state bootstrap function. And again, open looks exactly as you expect it to. We're going to uh, create our state descriptor, register that with the runtime. And then for every account, we're going to store its balance in state. Uh, again, there's a context if we'd like to set timers. But you'll notice there's no collector, right? This looks exactly like a process function except for the collector. And the reason is that this is a sync. We are writing data out, and so it is a terminal operation. And so what do we do? Well, we have our accounts that are being read from somewhere. Uh, and this could come from anywhere you like, so uh, database, file system, et cetera. And we're going to create a operator transformation. We're going to bootstrap it with our accounts and then key by our account ID. And finally, bootstrap it into our operator. At the end, we are able to now build up a save point. So I'm going to say, hey, use the memory state backend, set my max parallels into 128, and then register my transformation. We could have any number of uh, operators in our safe points. And finally, write it out to some location. If I wanted to add a new operator to an existing safe point, I would simply load that safe points and add the operator instead of uh, creating a brand new one. I could then use this to restore my updated job. So let me check the time. Uh, I am going to go ahead and breeze through this roadmap so I can get to the question. Uh, there is a open flip for a unified save point format. Currently, you cannot uh, take a save point with the heap state backend and restore with the RocksDB state backend. Uh, but we would like to make that a possibility, uh, expected at some point down the road. And also looking at upgradability dry run. So we talked about schema migration. We talked about how Flink will fail your job if it fails to migrate your code. It would be great to know if that migration would fail before we ever deploy anything. Uh, that is ex exactly what this feature would potentially solve. Uh, there are some ideas about how to do this, but uh, nothing set in stone yet. So thank you all so much. Uh, please, please, please uh, let me go through your questions and thank you for uh, reaching out.